Okay, welcome back immediately after the last one, which is now in its case. Here comes the second of Ron's two ES339s, the small sized, well, relatively small sized semi acoustic guitar, which I really like the shape of. Um, these are pretty darn good, and everything about these I like. Um, the, the pickups are a little darker than my preference, but I know that Ron really likes them for the work he does, plays bluesy kind of music, so suits him really fine. Um, but it's, you know, don't ever take anything I say about pickups as either gospel truth or anything but subjective personal experience, because that's all it is. Um, that one, we discovered a surprising and unexpected crack where the, the headstock had taken a, a whack and it was cracking the wood on both sides and I was able to lever it open and put some glue in it. Uh, and disguise the um, or smooth out the finish which is great so that's stable this one has no none of those problems at, that I've seen so far um, although in every other respect it's very similar slightly lighter fingerboard um, you know obviously a different finish but you know equally nice I played this one this morning for about an hour or something like that and the things I discovered um, were that it, it played pretty well actions a little bit high um, jack sockets wobbly uh, and it doesn't hold tuning at all um, and that's a combination of um, the terrible plastic nut that Epiphone insists on fitting but it's also a combination of unstretched out slack in the strings and I, I don't mean to when I point that out to people about their guitars I don't I never mean to be some sort of critical hectoring eject is that allowed to say that word? Anyway, you know, a rude git, um, basically. I, I don't mean to be like that. I, I'm, what I'm really doing is just pointing out that... Um, can I actually move this? Ooh. I'm just trying to figure out a way to attach this so I can get a, a more interesting view from somewhere. Let's have a... Look what happens if I tighten this up this way. Oh, I see. So that doesn't move until I move this. Then that moves. That moves. I can tighten that up. That moves. Where am I looking? See, now I've got to a place where I can get a fantastic view, sort of, but I have little or no chance of seeing what it's seeing. So it's all, it's all very well having a fab view. Well, that isn't any good either, is it? It's, wow, what a fabulous long-range view. Not. Look, you can see a lot of board and bench. Well, let's leave it there for a minute, just for something different, right? But then I want to bring you down for the close-ups, but I can do that because it's quite easy to grab hold of. Anyway, um, yeah, the crap nut that Epiphone fits. So, like the last one, we're going to take the nut off and we are going to replace it with a custom adjustable nut, for which I have a base here. And we'll use one of, um, one of the number three bases, I hope we will. Gerard, very, actually, oh, no, hang on, these, got extra, these are custom, custom, different type things for a different job. Um, yeah, Gerard very kindly made me different heights, slightly different heights of base. So we've got a number three to go with our straight off the shelf um, adjustable nut. And uh, I, I've got, I bought some of these, not in bulk exactly, but I had. I think I've had about 10 at one go, but I, I do swear by these, so I use a lot of them. So I always feel happier when I've got half a dozen. Oh, I must not forget to stick the little green thing to the thing. The key for the adjustable nut needs to go on the scratch plate pick guard thing because I'm terrible at remembering it. In other words, I'm great at forgetting it. Just Hold on one second while I stick it on there. I know it's a, an unnecessary diversion. But if I don't do it right now, there's every chance I'll forget it altogether. And that would be really annoying. Oh, would you come along? All right, green frog tape, scratch plate, down it goes. Lock. Okay. Yes, so now <laughs> thank you for reminding myself. Okay, well after that fabulous uh, high high vis, no, high angle. Gee, that's frightening really. That's the bag folding up. So what I'm gonna do first 
is I'm just going to use some sandpaper to um, flatten off the feet on these on this so, so the little grub screws on these nuts sit through poke through and they're what are they called cup type cup is it yeah cup type so they're not massively pointy and sharp but they're still pointier than I'd like them to be so my aim to begin with is just to uh, flatten them down and I sort of do it by the old side to side rocking motions I like to sand them down until they're flattened out um, and that allows me to I suppose it it just spreads the load of the strings over the plastic of the base part of things just a little bit easier okay that's pretty good maybe a little bit more on this end so it's just a a little detail to help make my system work better and that for those of you who might not know my these little tu tusk adjustable nuts that I use are made by Graph Tech but they're uh, they were made for one application only and that was for the Gibson Les Paul um, and I I'll show them in detail in a minute because you're miles up there now uh, and I adapted them for my use in doing this kind of work so let's just do a couple of observations of this ES339 in tobacco sunbursty thing iced tea sunburst whatever you like to call it um, some people get upset when I don't know the exact name even the name of the guitar let alone the the specialist color thing you know and I and I hope not to insult people or upset people or disappoint them by saying I don't care right and, and that, what I mean is I don't I, I love the different colors and I everything I like every pretty much every guitar so I don't mean it from a dismissive point of view but I don't care what this is called it doesn't matter to me what it's called what I know about it is it's a it's a um, semi-acoustic hollow body um, what would we call it uh, yeah hollow body semi-acoustic guitar made by Epiphone it's called an ES339 and you know even if I didn't know it was called that it, it really doesn't matter because it's a guitar with some electronics and pickups and uh, a neck glued neck uh, and some tuners and a neck with a truss rod you know so it basically it is a very familiar object um, and knowing its name doesn't improve what I can do there are some things it's useful to know like there are some uh, some things here to oh that's Kevin um, there are some things here uh, like switches you know which are good to know and the coil splits um, but apart from that I don't need to know what its absolute number is it's a ES339 VS VS what would that be vinegar sunset <gasps> no you know you tell me anyway um, so I don't mean to be in, you know insult the aficionados but it I, I get I work with what I see and it doesn't really matter so much to me of course it matters to you because you've heard, searched high and low for this model that you love and that, I totally get that but it's not important for me so first fret action here is not bad a little bit high and the last fret action here uh, is also I think a fraction high and what I'll also do yeah that, that, as I thought that's about that's about just about on 2.5 mils about a mil higher than it has to be down at this end it's 1.5 so a little bit higher than it has to be um, what I don't know is I mean, a little bit of zing going on um, what I haven't checked just this second is the relief on the neck um, now the last one I did had very little relief it's very flat and it plays great so I'm going to look at this one and you know again people get really uptight and they go oh you didn't measure the relief you know what about Epiphone specs or well, what about Epiphone specs they're they're a, a start point and the whole point of the um, setting up a guitar is to is to set it to whatever you prefer now I know that that equates to about 0.2 of a millimeter and that's enough relief typically on a guitar like this uh, certainly as much as uh, perhaps a fraction more than that one had and that one plays great at a very low action so 
why do I need to know any more specifics than that? If you like more, uh, if you don't like the way this plays once I've done it, well, I've, I will have leveled it to its absolute lowest and you can increase the uh, curvature of the neck if you prefer more space here. And by the way, that, you know, that comes back to a, a often misconceived idea that um, you adjust your guitar's action by um, adjusting the truss rod. Um, you don't. That's not a primary purpose of the truss rod. The primary purpose is to allow you to control the amount of relief or curvature in the neck. And why do you want to control it? Because the strings will pull the wood into a, a curve. Um, and you need to control it because you need to give it only as much as your strings need in the process of spinning at their wide, at the widest points, which is somewhere around about there-ish. Now, amusingly, the centre point of the truss rod is about here, so it's always offset. So that's just another long-winded, kind of interesting, nerdy type debate. But in general, the curvature of the neck, um, the the lower you have an act, the lower your action is. The, now, let's come back to the beginning. Your strings need space to move, right? And you want them to move without slapping into the frets, okay? If you have a very low action, you're taking away at both ends. You are removing the space they've got to move, and they, you know there's a risk that they will, they're more likely to hit the strings as you strike them. Um, so you can see that the, the room for the strings to move around in is a combination of or is affected by the height of the action at the nut, the height of the action at the bridge, and the um, amount of curvature underneath that. So all of those three things together, you can give the strings loads of room to spin, which means if you're a heavy hitter, you can avoid the strings ever doing what I call, um, you can avoid string slap, as I call it, right? Um, but if you like a low action, well, you, you still need to have room for your strings to uh, move without hitting the frets. Um, and so as, as you go down in your choice of action, then I have to do a couple of things. I have to make sure the neck has enough curvature in it to allow the strings to move. And that becomes more critical the lower you set the two ends, the action at both ends. Um, and then it, it also then helps in the process as well to level out the not only the any high frets, but to level out the sort of undulations of the fretboard, which are natural when it's under compression. So that the lower you want it, um, and the flatter you want it, let's put it that way, the more I need to um, level the frets and gently level out the overall shape of the board. And they're two separate activities. And that's an interesting distinction because when I first started doing this method of fret leveling, um, I, only, I was only really conscious that it was great at leveling frets, as in taking down high frets and bottom, bottoming out low frets. That was what I call fret leveling. And that would get you out of sort of dead notes in very specific places. But then over the years, I became aware of being able to do that very well. And then there still being this thing that I called fret slap. And fret slap was characterized by being a kind of buzz in every position. So no, it wasn't caused by one or other fret. It was all the way along. And then it, I sort of began to realize that it could only be because whatever the configuration I had set here, it just meant the strings didn't have enough room to move um, without striking the, the next fret. So um, luckily what I discovered was that the second function that the truss rod or the banana leveling method that I use, the second function that it has or the second benefit it gives is not only does it level frets uh, when they're specific problem areas, but as a general rule it keeps its shape and allow, if I'm very careful it allows me to um, gently smooth out any, as I said, undulations that are inherent in the board. Now this is not like individual frets, this is little clusters of frets in, in various patches. And so we gently impose the kind of smooth curve of the truss rod onto this bumpy surface and that helps to just free up that tiny amount of room required for the strings to play without slapping. So that's a secondary benefit of the my truss rod levelling method. But like I said, the misconception is that you you um, adjust your action by bending the neck more or less. What you, you don't. Your truss rod is there to allow you to control the amount of space you can give the strings here. And and the more you'll, you'll adjust more or less depending on how high you've set the action here or whether you've done any fret leveling or not. Um, so the, the kind of rule is to mainly there's a simple way of looking at it. People say, how much relief do you need? Um, the first thing is, 
if you have your neck shaped like that, back bowed like that, rubbish, you can't play, right? The strings will choke out in the first half of the neck. So it, rule number one, it cannot be bow, back bowed, humped. Uh, can it be dead flat? Well, yes, but you will limit how low your action at either end can be. And for it to be flat, you tend to need the frets to be perfectly level because anything that isn't level will show up very quickly. Um, so can it be level? Can it be dead flat? Just about, but you have to have a higher action at the ends, probably, and you, and you have to have level frets. Uh, so you can see that I'm heading towards saying that the ideal is very slightly curved, right? And now a lot of people don't seem to know that. They get on, you see them on video saying, this neck is dead flat, that's just how we like it to be. Now, I'm not criticizing that some people will like the neck flat, providing the other factors are in tune with it. In other words, if, if you're a player and you've got your lovely Ibanez Prestige guitar and you want this neck dead flat, well, like, you know you can't have it kept back bowed, but you can have it dead flat. That will, that will impose upon you um, if you want a low action as well, it'll impose on you the need to level these frets very, very carefully and very precisely. At that point, you can have flat neck, you can have as you know, pretty low action, and you'll, you'll get it by le leveling the frets really precisely. But from, on a lot of guitars, a dead flat neck is not what you need, because you will get fret slap straight away, and that will... That will uh, either annoy people so much that they have to raise the action again and that will annoy them even more or the worst thing is is if somebody gets fret slap which is not caused by individual uneven frets it's caused by a lack of overall space for the strings to spin the mistake some people can make and I've made it in the past I, I think myself is that you can try and fret level it out as if you're trying to level out a single uneven fret and you won't do it right? um, I found that with a stiffer truss rod, um, you, it, oh, oops, I found with a stiffer truss rod, um, it will eventually level out, but I have to approach it as a, sec a separate step, and I have to do it in a particular way. Um, suffice to say that when, at the point at which I do it, I have to uh, stop, um, I have to reduce all the force on the rod and just use it under gravity. This is a chisel wound that I made yesterday, so it's come back to annoy me. For sake of hygiene and stuff, hygiene, I'm going to uh, put it in a little kitchen roll bandage for the remainder of this. Okay, in a minute I'm going to bring you in closer. So that's just a sort of general talk through it, in case you've never heard that before. And for those of you who have heard me say it before, ad infinitum, I do apologise, because it's, you know, it's probably sounds of grannies sucking eggs at this point in time. But it's, um, it, always is it always amazes me that it took me, took me a while to sort of learn the, this extra benefit um, of the method that I use. I, I knew it was a great method for various reasons, um, but I have since discovered its, its extra functionality. Okay, so what do I know? Um, we're too high on the action. Um, we, we've got just about the right, right amount of um, relief for this kind of guitar. Certainly worked well on that last guitar. Um, and even though the action on here isn't particularly bad, it, the nut is not performing well. It's hot gripping the strings, so we want to take the nut off. So we're going to adjust this downwards and change the nut before um, I do any fret leveling of any kind. So I'm just going to bring this down here. I'm sorry. I won't know otherwise when the um, battery conks out. Now I don't need any fixing glue boost stuff for this time around because that was only for the cracks on the other one. So I get that out of the way. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the nut and remove it and we'll, re we'll tweak uh, we'll take the replacement nut into place, a little tiny bit of fine tuning, um, but it will go in easily. Now the reason I know it will go in easily is because thankfully what I love about Epiphones is unlike some of the modern, more modern makers who are cutting some production corners, Epiphone makes their, uh, makes their, their fits their nut and does their finishing in a certain way. I don't know if you can, how well you can see this, right? Can you see that this nut is 
um, I don't know how well you can see it, the nut is basically, get in focus, the nut is that little gap it's in, the little slot. It's basically they finish the guitar, including the headstock, all right, and then they route a slot in here and put the nut in. All right now, you might think, well, yeah, so, um, but a lot of corner cutters of the modern world are doing it differently. What they do is, they, when the guitar is raw wood, they put the nut in and they spray the finish around it. And what happens is, the finish gets sprayed up to and up the side of the nut to about a thickness of sometimes a millimetre and a half even. You know, it's very thick finish. Um, and if you never changed the nut, that wouldn't be a major problem. But, you know, if you then stuck a plastic nut that I really want to change. On these guitars, like some of them, like Harley Benton's in some cases, uh, it's been, uh, I've had it on a vintage as well, that's done the other way. Um, I.e. the nuts put on first, glued in place, and then spray the finishes that applied. The fact that it locks this nut into this thing um, is, is okay if you don't ever want to change it. But if you want to change it, you're, you have to do the following, which is to tap the nut to remove it. Now, you people have this, I've, I've whinged about this, so I'm not going to do too much, but people know it all. People go, oh yes, you've got to get a knife and, s and score down the sides of here. Sounds great on a guitar like this Epiphone, right, where you can get a knife down the side of there because of the way they've manufactured it, right? On the guitars I'm talking about, you will not get a knife down there because it is like a bed of superglue or a, a, a sleeping bag of superglue running up to, pressing up against the sides of there. It's glued to it. And you've got no gap down there, so there's no point cutting down there. So this idea with clever people saying, oh, you should have scored this. Yes, you can do it with this one, but you don't need to, right? The ones you need to do it with, or you'd like to be able to do it with, there's no way you can do it. You might as well be um, just getting ready to break a window, because that's what you're doing. You're, trying, you're thinking you're going you're gonna to score glass. You're not. You're going to chip it, and if, at best, and at worst, it's going to shatter all over the place. And that's what continues to happen. So, Epiphone, allow this to happen. Thank you, Epiphone. Look at that. Two Epiphone, oh, no, that's not one. Two Epiphone nuts come off with a little bit of glue on the base. Yeah, okay, not a bad thing. Leaving behind a very clean slot that we can now work straight away with. There's a tiny little bit of plastic stuck in here, courtesy of the glue, so I just want to um, just sort of ease that out because we don't need, <laughs> we don't need plastic in the, at the angle of the corner. We want that to be as right angled as possible. Okay, so now, thanks to Epiphone's brilliant production methods, I've said it enough, um, now we're ready to place this in. Now I know straight away that this is a fraction too thick, but only a fraction. So I'm going to need to do a very small amount of sanding of this uh, nut and base combination. Now it's a little bit annoying because right now I'm now slightly fingerless on one side. Now it's not as, the trouble is when you sand this stuff, it dirties it up a little bit. We'll have to kind of worry about that afterwards, but what we're aiming to do is just get this right down to the perfect fit size. We're almost there. I'll just take a tiny little bit off the front. Just any burrs, really. That's all I'm concerned about. Just get any little sort of in smooth, unsmooth burrs. And I'm trying to see if I can just clean up the other side again. Nearly. Okay. So this will now, again, this is why I do love Epiphone. This will now drop into there with the most perfect fit. How about that? So I don't even have to glue it at this point in time. I can just load the strings back on for a minute. Um, I also know, thanks to Gordon, my friend who makes the 3D bases for me, nut bases, I know that this thing is going to sit on at the, almost the perfect height to the strings. I, I designed this nut, these nut bases, in, well, it, the idea is to have them at the size that when you fit them to the guitar, what you want is the strings to sit on the first fret. And what I'll do is tighten up the, the D and the G first to make sure that the adjustable nut part stays in place and everything's kind of pinned down. Then I'll put a little bit of tension on the others and then we'll tune. Whoops, we'll go the right way, we will. Okay, 
So what I haven't done yet is now go down and adjust the action. Now it's inter interrelated, so the point is if I raise the action now at this end a certain amount, okay, I can just see it now coming up above, the strings are coming up above the first fret as much as I'd like. Now that's about where I want it, but at the same time I know I want to lower it down this end. And you and I both know that if I now wind this in a little bit, to lower the playing action at this end, you know it's going to also microscopically, microscopically, Lily, <laughs> microscopically lower the action down there. So we know the two things are interrelated. Um, we just need to double check it at the other end. So this is a bit low now. So I'm going to go up again a little bit on this side. 1.5 on the bass string, low E. That's a fraction over. 1.5 there, and I want the 1.2 there, which is spot on. Okay, so now I want it in tune, and then I'm going to double check the first fret action. Okay, I'm not that bothered this second about perfect tuning. What I want to know is what's my height over the first fret. Well, technically it only needs to be high enough to play, um, but it can cause a little bit of buzz if it's not high enough. So I go for as little as is required to make it play. Now, one of the things I noticed about, remember uh, on various various videos you'll have heard me say the tuning on your guitar the stability of the tuning is down sorry you can't even see that can you it's down to two things it's down to the condition of your nut slot and the amount of slack in your strings now think about that What it means is 50% down to the condition of the nut. So if it's uh, if the slots are too uh, if the slots aren't deep enough and the first fret action is too high, your strings will play sharp as you fret them by the nut. Uh, if the fret slots, uh, the nut slots are made of plastic or they're too tight or some other material that isn't good, isn't smooth and slippy. Um, then they will grip the strings and cause a pressure differential, tension differential either side, which will go out of tune when you bend them and it will be out of tune. Um, so getting the right, getting the nut right is, is precise and important, but it's not just precise, it's incredibly important. It's 50% of your tuning stability. The other 50% is a bit that people often overlook, and it's the amount of residual slack in your strings. So I've sorted 50% of it out by changing the nut and fitting a tusk adjustable nut, which I know has PTFE in it, which makes it naturally lub lubricated. The slots are factory cut, so there's no shagginess to them. They're wide enough that they don't grip the strings in any way. This is about as good a, fi a nut fitting now, and it's at the perfect height because I fitted it as an adjustable nut. Right, so you can't get better in terms of nuts for a guitar like this. This is the king of all nuts, right? That's 50% of the tuning deal. The other 50% is this, right? In tune. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> Don't even ask me what happened there. Okay, that's the other 50%. That gross amount of detuning when I pulled it, right? Yes, I put muscle into it, right? But that it isn't because of the strength I put into it. That detuning is stored in your strings and it will come out slowly if you just play and think you're in tune and then you'll bend strings and you wonder at the end of the song, why, why does it sound so terrible? I did it all in one go to show you, not, not that that's how you normally play, but I'm showing you that that, that slack is there. 
and you may not know it. Okay. And it's there. Until it isn't. Uh, this is probably going to break now because I think it's pulled the... I thought it had pulled the... Uh, unraveled the ball. Okay, back in tune. So that huge handful of pull, all of that's detuning, right? Had you, if you, if you didn't pull it like I just did, it's still going to come out and it's going to come out every time you play and you'll be annoyed because it'll be out of tune. That's why you've got to start seeing your tuning stability as 50% that slack. And, you know, if I then go and pull it again, right? And we find that even more comes undone, just even a little bit, that's still more waiting to come out. And you might start thinking, well, he's basically saying that we have to do this until there's no more detuning. I mean, is that right? And that is right. Look, we're out of tune again. Some people like to think that somehow when you do that, it, there's a belief some people have that me pulling that is causing these to unwind or, you know, turn backwards. And it will always happen if I yank it that hard. Not at all. They aren't moving a bit. All of that is coming out of the string train from the ball end to the final end of the windings on there, right? And if you want your guitar to stay in tune, so that it's a joy to play. You're going to have to stretch all of that out before you start playing. That's 50%. We've done it. When I fit, I'm not going to do it now anymore on these strings um, because I'm going to throw them away. But when I replace them at the end of this job, I'm going to stretch that until they don't detune any further. And then that action plus that nut is going to make this guitar like that one that's in its box now. It's going to stay in tune for hours on end. And it's going to be in tune, more or less in tune, when you take it out of the box two weeks later. Okay. And that is that. Until you've had a guitar, I won't say set up by me, but I mean, until you had a guitar that you've done those two things fully to, you don't know you've, you're born. You, you'll, honestly, you will, you will wonder why you suffered all the years with guitars that wouldn't stay in tune and you would tell yourself that it was because you needed to buy more expensive, no, you wouldn't tell. Somebody on a forum would tell you it's because you needed to buy more expensive tuners or that something wrong with this type of bridge or the only ball strings, you know, go out of tune but rotor sound don't. It's n absolute balderdash. Two things only, that nut and the slack in your strings. I've been doing this for now eight years non-stop and I can tell you that's exactly what I found every single setup I've done. And I must have done a couple of thousand and more. And it's borne out. I don't, you know, people don't, sometimes people argue with things I conclude. And sometimes, very occasionally, I'm totally wrong and I revise my opinion when I learn more. But most of the time, or 99% of the time, um, when I say something year after year after year, it's because it is borne out every single time in practice. And I wouldn't be doing it. I wouldn't be saying it eight years, seven or eight years on, saying this th same thing if I didn't know it was borne out thousands of times in experimental practice, okay? So trust me on it. Okay, so we have done a few things. We've checked the relief. We've lowered the um, action down here to our target action. And if you were doing this kind of setup, you would, you would do the same. You would lower it to your target. At this end, you'd set it to your target at this end either with an adjustable nut, or even if you have to use a solid nut by using some nut files. Um, I used to use them all the time. I don't use them anymore unless I have to, unless I have to make a custom nut. I prefer to use the untouched factory slots, and I make, uh, um, I make it my business, wherever possible, to fit and utilize an adjustable nut, okay? Because I want that I want the slots to be untouched and I want them to be at the exact height that I want them to be at for the perfect first fret action. And I'm not going to compromise. And if the best way to get that is to make it adjustable, then I will uh, I will improvise, innovate, whatever I'd have to do. 
So we've got the action at this end set as low as I want it. We've got the action at this end with the nut right set as low as I want it. And we've got about 0.2 mils of uh, relief. Now I've lost a finger. Now because this is fairly old guitar and, and because Epiphone frets are actually quite good these days, or very good these days I would say, this is probably going to play okay. A little bit of zizzing going on. Not bad, but... A little bit of zizzing out. So overall, very good frets. Um, nothing standing out as a completely I completely choked out. What I will say is that we'll probably start to hear fret slap. Now listen to the, the, the little bit of buzz, the after buzz, if you like, all the way up from about the G onwards. I don't know, maybe the A. About from here to about here, every note is associated or accompanied by a little bit of buzz. That's what I call fret slap, not fret buzz. So that tells me it's because the uh, strings haven't got quite enough room at this action setting and with this amount of relief. Now you could crank the relief even harder, get more space if you wanted to, and that would probably help it because it will create more space for the strings. And that's the only reason you crank the relief, to create more or less space for the strings to move. Um, the difference I'll do is because there are a couple of sort of choke outs starting to happen up here um, that I'm going to do a very light leveling but I will also um, I will do a leveling first to get rid of those little choke outs um, or those hints of choke out and then uh, I will also be doing by the time I get sort of across to here I will be thinking of the truss rod file as more of a um, overall um, curve imposer as I talked about earlier on to allow to just gently iron out the, the humps in this and it, you know when you look at this thing you go it's a curved neck there are no humps and even if you look down here you'd say no I can see a tiny bit of curvature and it's all it's not perfect at all it's imperfect it's made of wood so it has these little humps little wibbles and I kind of describe it like the seabed you know it might go down deep and then come up to the shore on the other side generally speaking but along the way it's all over the place. And that's the same with these, particularly when they're under tension of string loading. So I've got that where I want it, I've got that where I want it, and I've got that where I want it. And there's a very small amount of work needed. And remember that this nut is now perfectly in place, but it's not glued in, right? So we'll need to worry about that a little bit later. But for now, I'm just going to mark up the frets. And there's a couple of frets had a little tiny bit of marks on them, which would be good too clean up and round off. They've been sort of leveled a little bit, possibly by age. Maybe someone in their past has done a very light bit of leveling. Um, kind of uh, natural leveling tends to be grooves. Ow, Unless you're, 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 you're definitely not a chords player and you know all you ever do is sort of, you know, individual notes and, and bends, in that, which case that can have a more of a general flattening effect. But you, you tend to see where expressed, I think, in, in terms of um, grooves where strings are pressed down. If you, if you, my, uh, it's been my experience that if you, if you see a guitar with very, level, very flat frets, it's either something that's been leveled in the past, maybe heavy handedly, or occasionally it, it can be one of those stylistic things which I've yet to fully understand why, but people seem to pay money to have it. We called it, what is it, Fretless Wonders. And I know that there was a Gibson, part of the Gibson range where that was all the rage, apparently. Um, and you had these frets that were practically, they were about like sticking a bit of tin foil on the guitar and they had almost no height and they were just wide, flat strips. Um, now, why anybody would want that is totally, I have to say, beyond me, because uh, it messes up, it has to mess up the point of intonation of the string, or of the fret, and it moves it to the front edge of the flat spot. And, and that fact is why we re-crown frets. 
why we do it at all to return them to a arch shape um, is to bring the, the intonation point if you like it's not a correct term but bring the point at which the string touches the fret to the center of the fret and that keeps the intonation correct across all the strings if it's flat like a, re a dead flat it moves to the front edge of the flat or the bridge closest to the edge of the flat closest to the bridge which moves bumps all of the all the um, intonation off slightly okay so what I've done there is I've prepared the frets for leveling so while it's been a, a pleasant little chat um, I'm actually about to go and commit serious leveling to this guitar um, and in a way after that the even though it's been informal and chit chat the precision serious hard precision work will be done and I always say that but there's quite a lot of work still to do but it, it feels to me like the um, you know the, the sort of well mechanically speaking the the hard work is done um, this is the this is the bit I suppose in a way one of the, the main part that you know, anybody's paying me for the years of having done is the operation of this tool um, so what I'm doing is I'm using these three little brass feet um, and if you if you're into maths and physics and stuff like that you you, you I am imagine it like this there's a there's a sort of rough curve yeah you, can, you know there's a broadly speaking there's a a concave curve which we call relief that's the neck relief a concave curve by putting these three little feet at three broadly speaking equally spaced positions and then adjusting this until it touches all three simultaneously what I've done is I have I've sampled this curve at three points but as you know that could be really inaccurate because it could go down but between there it could go down between there in fact I'm just sampling the mountain tips right the mountain tops but I'm 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 averaging a curve with three sample points and that's quite crude but there's a good reason for it being crude so I then tune this truss rod which is a very particular one to that idealized sampled curve so this now is it has a certain kind of smooth curve along its length I can see it if I look down it and it's very linear linear and smooth it's not a great big U shape but it's just a, a gentle curve that curve is smoother and more progressive and equally spaced between these three points than this actual neck itself is right or the yeah the neck so the neck is sort of overall it's get it's it's the same curve but it's full of lots of little ups and downs along the way these three sample points don't see it they go they go it's this high here that high there and this high here like digital sampling it's a bit like that if you kind of thought how digital pictures and stuff work so it's three sample points of a complex curve and then we simplify it by mapping that complex or those three points onto a tool that recreates a, a smooth curve which is we know straight away is much smoother than the actual slightly uh, imperfect curvature of this neck and then what happens then when I have that mapped or matched or calibrated as I call it and then the first thing I do is I push the strings aside and I put this with its 400 grit sandpaper on here and I let it kind of go up and down cutting gently into the frets now I know it only needs to be gentle so I don't have to apply any significant or substantial force to this I'm just sort of holding it in place and I'm just going either side of the E string if you can see it I'm, I'm just whizzing a bit from side to side and I'm going to stop and this is the point at which that tool works as a really good diagnostic because after eight years of doing this or seven or more years I can read what it tells me cutting cutting not cutting not cutting not 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 a little bit a little bit a little bit lots 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 none lots so there's a low one between two high ones because they're all reasonably high I can tell you that one's just low and then there's five low ones in a row so we've got cutting not cutting cutting big chunk one not cutting one cutting and then a low spot so the dark bits where it's not touching at all are the pits in this little seabed drawing right um, so you can if you drew it out as a cartoon well let's do it for fun you draw it out as a cartoon right this neck 
Are you going to focus, pal? Yeah. This neck maps out to uh, high. <laughs> I can't even draw it very well. High, low, quite a lot of low, high, then a long period of high. I'm not doing it very well. Um, what did we find? Oh, there's a sort of low one there, and then it goes a bit low again. So that's really crude, but that's a sort of map of this, the seabed here. It's badly done. And what we're going to do courtesy of this thing with the curve I was talking about, and I've done, I've done a pretty lousy job of drawing it, but the point is, I'm going to impose, I should have done, so let's say here was our first one, here was our second one, and let's say, it wasn't quite that extreme, bear with me a minute, sort of low-ish, and then here was our third one, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to, we've made a, a beam that sort of cuts across all three like this, Okay, so you can see straight away what will happen if I pr if I take the little feet away now, and I start pressing down with that beam, it's going to chop away stuff there. It's going to miss that one because it's down at the bottom, right? It won't touch that one. It's going to chop away some there, and then it's going to not chop away any. Oh, it's going to chop away some there because it's at the top of that hill, and that's exactly what it's doing here, right? So that what is telling us that that little diagnostic thing that I began to learn over all that time. That shows us the topography, I suppose, not typography, topography, I suppose you could call it, of the fingerboard, which to all intents and purposes you'd think is curved. Well, it sort of generally speaking is curved, but it's, it's at a closer sample, if you like. It's up and down. And the smooth rod is telling us what the shape is. And it's, and it's telling us we've got, we've got potential problem here because this low one down here will... Uh, if you've ever heard what I go on about, high frets are kind of easy to deal with, right? Because a high fret might be sitting up here, poking out, and you go, right, got to take that down. And as you come down with that beam, lo and behold, choo, it'll chop its head off, right? A low fret, by by um, contrast, is is uh, it the low fret creates the next fret as relatively high between this point here and this point here. And the only way you're going to stop that the problems of that happening, and in fact, it, it makes this fret behave as if it was that one, i.e. physically much higher. It doesn't matter, it doesn't care that it's actually lower compared to that one, it just knows that it's that much higher than this one at the bottom of the trough. So actually, what we have to do is we have to let this tool bottom out this whole section in order to bottom out the low fret. Now it sounds dramatic, and there really aren't that many alternatives. Um, it's far more dramatic sounding than it actually is, first of all. Um, so this, this low fret here, for example, and these two, three low frets there, at this edge, um, we want to, ideally we want to bottom them out, but I'll show you how little, relatively speaking, it takes to do that. So the amount of levelling I've done so far is very small, um, even though if you're new to it, you might be quite scared, thinking, wow, I can see, you know, cut metal. It's, I've been taking away fret metal, but I know that it's been pretty small. So what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to apply a little bit of more force, if you like, to the, to the rod in middle and, you know, the ends and stuff. So I'm basically taking a little bit more material as I go, and I'm kind of going backwards and forwards. And this will now show me something. So it's just beginning to cut this low one, and it's just beginning to touch these. So I know that the difference between these now and the ones that are cutting are now t infinitesimally small. It's beginning to, uh, it's missing, or it's beginning to cut this one on the edge, and it's missing that one. So that's the lowest one of all, probably. Now, if you really wanted to be um, sort of old-fashioned about this, you could probably get a, a rocker at this point, and you could say, okay, what are we looking for? Um, there you go. Those three are all low, so they're all registering the same. Um, that one, that one's lower than that one, so it's rocking. They're all the same. They're currently all the same. So you, you can find, using the old technology, around and about where you've got a low one, there you go, you will find the low one creates a rattle. So we've made the low one the far right one of this little test. There it is, showing up. So it's handy to confirm, but I don't need to use it because I can tell from the, the tool I'm using. Now, the great thing about this method, as I've always gone on about, is you say, well, 
Okay, look, you've done some cutting here. You're just beginning to touch the ones that you had down as low and problematic. Um, and you've got a couple more up here, but they are just, I'm almost now starting to get touched by the tool. The question you ask now is, yes, okay, we've, does it play? Yes, we don't need to go any further. That choking that we had before um, really came into play when we reached the middle of what I call the G track, okay? Because that's when you bend the string, not only this way, but uphill as it comes over the fret. Um, and that's where, if this fret is slightly high in the G track or low in the G track, that's where those effects that I talked about will come into play and you'll hear it choking out there. So we had a little bit of zizz earlier on, as I call it. We've leveled enough on the E track from, oh no, I'm not going to do this, Leve, leveled enough on the E track that I'm confident that all the notes play individually. And that since we're not, when we, we're not bending the E onto itself, you know, it only makes it, it only causes trouble when we bend it across it substantially into the B track and the G track. So I'll just test for that when I uh, level out the, the B and the G track. So I'm moving on to the B track and I'm very lightly running the um, beam up and down. And I'm kind of expecting uh, the same things we saw before to be repeated on the B track. Uh, and that's usually the case, although it's not always the case. So the point you have to remember is that the highness and lowness of a fret can change over its radius. So it may have been hammered in harder at this end, but sticking up at that end. It's entirely possible that it changes across its radius. But we're largely seeing the same. Three untouched, um, one not being touched much down here, which was the low one, and a couple at the end which are barely being touched. Um, so that's not too bad. I will, what I'd like to do is just pressure it a little bit now um, to the point where we just start to see these three together just being kind of bottomed out a little bit. Well, not bottomed out, but just, just brought into play, just touched. And we're not getting to them just yet. That's quite interesting. These three are still uh, showing up as as um, low. Now, down there on that part of the neck, it isn't usually a critical problem because you're not bending huge distances. So it may be that we don't have to stress about it. So it's not. there's nothing set about how far we have to go. What I want, first of all, is do all the notes play cleanly. Not bad. Can we bend across into the B track? Yep, nothing obstructing bending into the B track. Now it's time to move on into the G track. Um, and this time I'm going to recalibrate because they have to, the, the E and the B have to share the same calibration for the simple reason we can't calibrate off the board when we do the E. So the E shares the B calibration position, so to speak. This is still kept its relief. By the way, the relief can change from one side of the radius to the other as well. That's why I keep calibrating. I don't assume, I don't set it once at this position here and then leave it for this position. So here we are onto the G track. And this is, this, like I say, this is the one that any obstructions in the big bends tend to show up here. And this is where we sometimes have to work a little bit harder. Now you might say, well, that's, you're only working harder on that because you're concerned about those bends um, you know, reaching the middle of the G string or the G track, which of course is exactly what you are concerned about because that's how you play guitar more or less. Um, now, cutting, cutting, not, these three are, are low, consistently low all the way. Now, the thing is, sometimes you can think, well, have these three been hammered or pressed in harder? It's very unlikely. What's much more likely is we've got a sunken part of the neck, and that's exactly what I drew there. This is lower than the, uh, the rest, and it's just a, it's just a, a cavity or a, you know a canyon. Okay, so th that's that's what this tool tells me, and it's it's always right because it's just simple physics. So I know I've got a little canyon there. The qu the question is, I, I can know it, and I don't have to worry about it, providing everything plays okay. 
Now it picks up a little bit of ziz there because of that canyon. With my finger missing, I haven't got that much strength. <laughs> okay, it's not bad. Sometimes you might find, uh, the other thing I haven't said, if you've got a, a little trench like this, um, what you might find is, or typically will find, um, when, a thing, when, when you bend across here and something chokes out, it isn't necessarily because this is high. Well, let's, see. let's say we bend here, right? And we bend across, and as we get across to the G track, it chokes out. It isn't because... Um, it isn't necessarily because the next fret is high. It could very well be because the, the one we're bending on is already in a trough, right? That will make the next one high, and that's why it chokes out. But we still have the same problem, which is we have to, um, we have to, if we want that bend to be freed up, but we don't want to raise the action, we have to work on the frets and just bottom out the low patch so that you can do that bend across into the G track without the next normal heighted fret appearing like it's too high because we're bending from the bottom of a trough upwards sounds a, a lot of well, look, that's see all that tuning still falling apart now we've got those bends and it's not zizzing i'm going to do a tiny bit more in this g track just to be on the safe side um, and there's no harm in doing it sometimes i turn the thing around it just makes me feel differently about it um, and what you'll see is once you've, what I find is once I've leveled out any, or sorted out any obvious high frets or low patches which are obstructing bends, then I find myself lightening the touch and concentrating on the curvature to gently flatten or straighten out the curve as in the diagram on the board, you know, that uneven curve. Because as you press, as you press down on something um, with this, even with this, it does do the work faster on leveling out frets, but it also flattens or it, it will kind of distort the bar a little bit. So if I, when I want to um, make sure there's enough room so there's no fret slap, that's when I tend to back off, let it resume its correct curve shape. Now this has changed shape. Either the bar's changed shape or the radius has changed shape. I'm just gonna add a little bit of bend into the bar now to make it map, perfectly map the D track okay so now i'm going to do the d track and it's from the d onwards because you you very rarely bend a note from the e across into the d because the reason you don't bend it quite that far usually is that you're starting to go downhill if you think of the fret shaped like a hill you're bending e up to the top of the hill which is in the g track usually between the g and the middle midway between the g and the d track once you go past the d you're going downhill again and that will take away any clearance you've got and so players rarely go past that much past that point so what I tend to find is that when I'm on the D track I'm much more focused on um, light this light touch now when I want this curvature uh, to kind of scoop itself into the, uh, the shape of this fretboard um, and and I allow it to do its work with as, as little distortion of the bar as possible. And if I'm going to distort it at all, I probably want it distorting right in the center so it's a nice smooth curve either side of it. But um, you know, what I don't want to do is ram all the force on at this end, which makes that end float, really. So I'm aiming at this point, I'm from the D onwards, I'm really thinking about the, the fret slap. Unless, of course, I come across a really high fret and it obviously needs leveling. But... I'm listening to clean notes at a very low action currently. Tiny bit of fret slap comes back in there. Very little. That's almost perfect. I'm going to do a little tiny bit more. And again, this is the judgment call comes in again because I look at what I've done in the D track. There's clearly a couple of high frets here that I'm taking a fair bit off, one or two. Um, but that's fine. That's that's what the fingerboard is telling us. It's telling us about that peak we've drawn. So now I'm almost lighter. Now I'm I'm 
what I want is the, the little bit of fret slap in this section here to go and I want it really need the curvature of this rod to do that so I'm kind of I'm more like side to side and back to for, forwards I'm hardly hardly pressing down at all but I'm letting it I'm letting it just just clear out that little bit of fret slap as I call it now like I say it's done quite a lot of work on this bit here but that tells us we've got a we've got a distinct hump in this part of the neck but distinct hump sounds like a camel it isn't any you could barely see it but I know the tool is telling me it's there that's almost gone I'm, I'm happy with that that's so little I wouldn't worry about it so now I'm going to recalibrate again for the A track and I'll do the same again in a minute for the E track and again from here onwards now I'm really thinking fret slap as our main enemy for such a low action and a flat neck as this um, so there's nothing surprising about the fact that there will be fret slap it's the strings don't have that much room to move because we've made a flat neck and a low action um, but that's deliberate and so what we're doing is we're challenging the frets to work with that and that's why the we use this or I use this technique the way I do I think what I, I used to say the way I describe it is most people's experience of playing the electric guitar was the condition of the frets dictated the action you could have on your guitar and that's just how it was and you you sort of learned to live with it and you accepted it and you you had no choice what I like to do is I like to as you saw in the literally the step-by-step -step process I tell the guitar the action I want and I make the frets comply now obviously I have to know what's feasible uh, and I have to know the limits to what leveling can achieve because there's no point scraping all the metal off here in pursuit of an impossible a low action so I'm in the I'm in the low spot here do you remember and that's causing that little bit of ziz The rest of it isn't bad, but that little low spot now is starting to kick in on the, and the reason it's affecting this A string, and it hasn't really affected before, is that the A string now, the thicker the string's getting, the, the more the string will move. It's got its different sort of spinning, flapping dynamic. And so if we want to get rid of that last little bit of fret slap, uh, this admittedly ultra low action, okay, and this is an action that's low enough that other players or other guitar techs might go what the hell are you doing nobody plays a guitar at that action you know there are different views on that my customers certainly want that that's what they asked me for so at this low action to get rid of that last little bit of fret slap if, if we call it there's just that little zing on those on those notes we have to get down i'm just starting to just contact those frets now so that's a, the level at which we might start to see that ekes out so we had remember here we had a little dip improving I'll do a tiny bit more because we can right I'm looking at it I'm evaluating we haven't taken that much off anywhere I'm just balancing out evening things out so I'm just going to kind of go from side to side with this very gently I tend to like that in the middle if possible um, I'm just gonna I want this to just sort out now it, temp, temptation is, is often to kind of press down on it but I, I've got to I've got to sort of allow it to keep its shape more than anything else I want it to keep its shape um, so I'm just gonna be careful not to over over squeeze it okay so the thing is we're just beginning to touch these and this one's being cut a little bit now as well so the two ones that are low that's causing a little bit of slap there are now kind of just about bottomed out and again it's not a huge amount of material taken away not bad much better than it was I'm gonna live with that okay so that's how it works um, you know and I get covered in black fret dust but overall it isn't a huge amount of material and it's far far less than the uh, file that I began with when I first learned from other people on YouTube, which was the, and I'm not knocking Crimson for it, but it was a Crimson fret leveling file, which is a, about an inch thick, uh, an inch wide, sorry, an inch wide. Um, and it 
I wouldn't even begin to know what the grit, well, it's not grit like this, it's a big jagged, you know, crosshatch file. And that thing would take material away like nobody's business. Um, and that's the standard way of doing it. Well, that ha has been. And of course, if you're, if you're perhaps, you know, not that bothered about the amount of fret metal you're taking away, then there's nothing wrong with that. You'll get to where you want to get to. But I personally think that it's too crude for my liking. Um, you know, and I know it's been done that way. And there'll, there'll be people to this day who come on my channel and say, just do it in a traditional way. You think you're clever. Well, I only think that I'm saving a certain amount of fret metal and I don't see there being a problem in that. But the, it's not the only reason I do this. There are a thousand other, those little tiny diagnostic benefits that you've seen, what it tells me about the condition of the neck that you won't know using the other method at all. So I have no apologies for continuing to use this method. So a little bit of fret slap around about there. So kind of this chunk of the neck I'm going to concentrate on. Okay, so I'm sort of just, when I say concentrate, I kind of, it's like I'm just, if I'm pressing anywhere, it's there a little bit. Uh, and I'm just sort of focusing my attention on it as much as anything else. Um, uh, but I'm also trying to resist the urge to press down too much because I want to keep the original shape of the, um, the rod or that sort of ideal curve. And I might, you know, go and lean at the edge a little bit um, since the tendency is to work a little bit inside of the edge. So I can see it's coming right to the edge, so that's good. I think we'll be pretty much there on this one. Tuning isn't, but... Low ones, yes. Yep, low. I'll do a tiny bit more now focusing on 12th and that will be it for this run. So again, there comes a judgment call point and you say to yourself, okay, I've, I've done what I can at this uh, low action. And if it's telling me, if the playability is telling me that there's not a lot more I can do to um, kind of level this out or, or or even when I've slightly smoothed out this bumpy seabed shape even when I've done that if there isn't quite enough uh, room for the strings to move um, then we have no real choice other than to tiny make a tiny adjustment um, either in the neck relief or in, um, raise the action at the bridge end and you know it's a judgment call and since I know how low this already is I don't really have a worry about doing that because um, it's it's very it's very low. The attention of the strings is important at this stage too, because low low tension strings will move more. So, I think mostly that's almost perfectly good. Um, uh, right now, that is sitting at one millimeter, so that is fractionally low. So, I think I think that deserves to just come up a tiny bit. Um, I think that's one and a half there. Okay, I'm happy with that. And now, so you saw that that little adjustment at the end, because I wasn't, or well, maybe I hadn't eyeballed it 100% correctly. What it showed, what it told me, was that I was, I was working with slightly lower action than than I know is not possible exactly, but ideal. But that's fine by me because we nearly got there, um, and then I don't mind raising it to the 1.5, which is the the ideal action anyway. So you know, just a, a little bit of adjustment there, which wasn't even a What's the word? It wasn't really even a compromise. We're at the ideal action that I like. So having done that, 
next stage now is to take the strings off and we'll throw these away. They've had done their time. And we'll go, when you've got an adjustable nut fitted, when you're taking the strings off, slack them from the outside inwards, just so that your nut doesn't go flying off in all directions. Now this is, this has been, oh no, don't, please don't. This appears maybe, possibly has been done with one of these tying up businesses, which I absolutely hate. <laughs> Sorry, but I do. Um, this, this, the chances now, having put a loop in this, please don't, owners, with a loop in this, the chances of me scratching your headstock now increase tenfold, and probably you as well. It's just not, not a good way to do it. Um, I don't know about that one particularly, and I don't think the others, hopefully the others aren't. I'm not saying that you do, Ron, I'm just saying if people are tempted to put a lock in the string, you don't need to, and it does, it does, um, when that happens, it does cause problems. So before I remove anything, I'm just going to assess where this nut sits to be in the right position, and it is dead center. So I'm going to glue it on in a second in, and, and ensure that it's in dead center um, as I do. Now this one is locked off as well. I hate it. Don't do it, please. So I have to now get, see, I have to get these things into play. And I have to try and drag it off to one side, which I can't do. And I have to try and cut it and then pull bits off with different tools. And it's just, it's just an invitation to bloodshed for a start. I get loads of injuries from this. Um, bloodshed and that happening. So that came off and poked me a hole in my finger there. So, my dear, dear people, don't. Please don't. Whatever you're tempted to do. The, this thing about tuners, you know, I mean, this actually this video is turning into everything I know in one video, but th this thing about tuners is the a lot of people are c convince a lot of other people that tuners do something they don't. They're, Tuners contribute nothing to your tuning stability, right? This is, a, this is a, a kind of controversial statement to make at a party to get get people arguing. But, well, if you have that kind of party, but um, they don't add anything to tuning stability. The cheapest tuners will hold tune perfectly well. The only things that contribute to tuning stability are the things I've already said, the nut and the slack in the strings. The tuners... Um, they never work, run backwards, they never undo, they never, even the cheapest ones, never uh, kind of cause the, the um, string, you know, the strings to come out backwards or anything. They stay exactly where they are. You can't, because of the gearing, you, you couldn't, the string would break before you could make the tuner turn backwards, okay? It's as simple as that. Now, there are reasons for buying replacement tuners, and those would be, um, that a higher geared tuner is a much more pleasurable thing to use. And it's smoother, and it's more precise in its adjustment as you're doing the thing up. But it doesn't hold the strings in any better or worse tune. And there are people who will swear to God that it's the, it is the case, because they will swear that because they've convinced themselves to go and buy a new set of expensive tuners to fix a problem, and then they will almost always decide that that has fixed it um, and and it I can guarantee you it's not that that's fixed it if it's fixed it will be something else accidentally happened like maybe the stretch was finally pulled out of all the strings or maybe you you've cleaned the nut out accidentally when you fitted the new tuners I don't know but the tuners will never make the difference because they don't actually do anything other than tighten up the strings so you know, there's a lot of people with vested interest in uh, selling you tuners, and there's a lot of kind of belief systems around tuners being, you know, crap or good. And just like people like to argue about tone wood and stuff and swear blind that they can hear one thing different from another thing, and, you know, this capacitor does that and that tone pot does the other. Um, when the truth is, the tuners you can have a guitar that stays perfectly in tune with the cheapest crappiest tuners on it now i'm as guilty as anyone else of wanting smoother looking expensive looking tuners but that's partly because if i'm making a custom guitar um, 
I know that the customer base is going to have a sort of view on inexpensive Chinese made stuff and they're going to call it cheap and it's not going to make them feel good. You know, like a, a you know, a Chinese watch probably keeps equally good time to your expensive tag. In fact, most cheap Chinese watches kept better time than my expensive tags that I've ever had. Um, but, you know, we still feel something about our tag chronograph on our wrist, you know, because we like to feel something about expensive goods and, and it, our relationship to them. Blah, 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 marketing 101. But anyway, the point being is, so I'm not stupid. I'm not going to put the cheapest tuners on uh, on a guitar that I'm making for somebody. I want to feel good about the having treated themselves to a custom spec guitar made by hand. You know, it, it, does, it doesn't make sense. But the other thing too, is what's absolutely true about cheap cheap tuners is they'll break very quickly compared to a well-made set or they can break very quickly so an example a couple of weeks ago i had great part, parts caster guitar in um, it was john's parts, parts caster and it had some chinese goto copy or goto style tuners on and they broke while i was setting it up you know simple as that they just gearing mashed up and broke some cogs off so my recommendation was bin them let's get a 30 quid set of quality decent quality wilkinson's in there and they'll do the job just fine um, and even you know wilkinson's obviously chinese made you know um, but up to a point there will be a basic good quality that will last for practically forever um, on all tuners the little well not this kind <laughs> most sealed tuners the little plastic rings um o-rings between the, uh, the petal thing the knob and the body they always break over years you know they're, they're plastic or nylon they're, they're made to break basically well, they're just destined to break so there's nothing you can do about it um, and if you buy goto they won't last any longer particularly that part of it because they'll break too so spend loads of money on expensive tuners for the style of them because they look cool or because you like the brand, that's fine. I'm not knocking you for that. Um, but don't expect them to actually keep the guitar in tune because they, they won't if the other things, certainly not if the other things I've talked about are not in, uh, are not sorted. So that's a that's a, maybe a controversial thing because obviously we have a, well, often we have belief system that says, you know, expensive is obviously better and and, and the fact that they're called tuners, <laughs> you know, is a, is a bit of a sort of giveaway. So we sort of expect them to play a role in tuning. Well, they do. They play the role in, in tuning it up to pitch. Um, and a 19 to 1 ratio tuner does that much more smoothly and satisfyingly and probably more accurately in terms of its, you know, how much it goes, how much the string moves for the amount you turn it. And that's a, that's a, a kind of a you're paying for a kind of precision feel and that's nothing nothing wrong with doing that at all but if you've got a tuning stability problem don't rush to spend 80 quid on a new set of tuners spend 80 quid on getting your nut sorted out uh, properly um, and then you can you'll have some change and then you'll be able to do the stretching the um, string oh, my fingers gone it's a spasm <laughs> string stretching a uh, bit yourself and then you'll have perfect tuning now i'm just going a bit overboard here because i'm still got the polishing out to do which will create a load of dust what i'm doing at this stage is i'm trying to take off all of the uh, marker pen that i've put on here because having recrowned it now that's done we're done with the marker pen and so it's a good point to get it all off but at the same time i can clean any grime off the fingerboard and once I've done the um, polishing out a little bit later on, um, then I will come back and put some oil into the fingerboard. This kind of wood, and I can't remember what it's called, um, uh, it, it won't soak up oil the way, or it won't appear to soak up oil the way that a you know conventional rosewood neck uh, fingerboard does, um, because it's it's a different kind of wood. But it will still. You know, it still look nice. I mean, it looks nice as it is. Obviously, when you think about it, wood and oil 
really aren't natural bedfellows although you know yes there's some very there's a few limited types of wood that produce their own sorts of oils but you know adding oil to wood isn't really doing anything other than darkening the surface of the wood you know and and the more porous the wood is the more oil it will soak up the more it will obviously darken and so what you're really always only ever doing with um, with oil is you're you're doing a cosmetic thing people people talk about um, you know I'm rehydrating the uh, this this very dried out fingerboard well you're re-oiling it you're not rehydrating it for a start um, and if you did rehydrate it too much it would probably warp because wood water and wood aren't the best friends as you know that's any any time you've ever had a warped guitar neck uh, it's because of water and, and water and warmth usually or humidity and warmth um so so you know there, there is you're not really humidifying anything um what you're doing is you're cosmetically adding oil and the more it soaks in, the darker the wood looks. And, it, and we like it looking dark. There's something about that. And the reason we do, I think, is because the, the, the classic guitars we've seen and kind of venerate, love, um, are always old and very, very heavily played. And by definition, that will have loads of kind of the human oils from the fingers and other parts. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, they will be well sort of ground into the fingerboard and so you know old woods always look great with a patina of oil and actually other things i mean this this tobacco sunburst is probably derived from literally tobacco stained sunburst finishes which people thought looked well played and you know reminded them of smoky rooms and jazz clubs and so on and so forth and so they made <laughs> tobacco stained things uh, tobacco colored things because now that kind of feels like a, a well-loved and well-played guitar. So what I'm doing at this point, as you can see, I'm just committing a fair bit of good old in, inert naphtha to cleaning up. Oh, I don't even know if I've run out of battery at this minute. No, we're still going. That's unusual. Whew. Um, I'm just giving this a, a, a scrub down to get any sort of watermarks and surface stuff off it. And sometimes there's st such gra ingrained stuff that I would temp be tempted to polish it out with that guitar polish stuff but a guitar like this is pretty clean and it really gets along just nicely with a, a, a naphtha clean out um, through and through okay um, what I'll also do while I'm here is I'll just clean up this Epiphone scratch plate give it a degrease front and back um, so the next part of the process for this guitar is to um, polish out the frets. And this will be done off camera because it's long and tedious. Um, so I'm going to mask off all of these frets and then I'm going to sand them out and I'm going to mask off the uh, guitar as well to protect the, this end of the body. Um, and then what I'll do is I will sand the frets uh, out and basically polish them up through a range of sandpapers and grits until we come to nice playable shine. Um, the good thing about having having um, leveled the frets to a, you know a, an exact low setup is that I can take all the parts off the guitar now, clean it up, put them all back on, and dial it back down to that low action, and I already know that it will play. I don't have to do any more messing about trying to set it up. You know, we've whoops, we've already cleared it for that action in the work we've already done. So um, we could, you know, take it all apart, mess it around, change things out. But as long as we put it back to that low action, it'll play just fine. Okay, let's get these little stings of broken off strings out of the way, so they don't hurt me mainly. Okay, so I'm going off camera. I'm going to mask all this off with masking tape, different types. And, um, and I'll come back when I've uh, polished it all out. I'm going to finish this tonight, so I've got two done guitars to take home. This one's been more straightforward, thankfully. 
um, mainly because, uh, yeah, it, the, the ES three three nines, by and large, I find them really enjoyable to do. Um, the, the only, you know, the extra challenge on that last one was the, the, the cherry one was the neck cracks, which you know, as I said on that video, it was disappointing for Ron because uh, it wasn't something the seller mentioned or knew about, which whichever you choose to accept but so it came as a surprise an unpleasant surprise to Ron so um, but uh, you know I, I really enjoy the uh, the ES339 setups because they are um, they're straightforward um, thank, thanks to Epiphone's generally very good condition necks and also um, their very good way you know the construction method particularly around the fitting of the nut which really makes it easier for me so i shall get off i'm going to put some crappy radio 4 comedies on and i'll see you in a minute a bit later when i'll be ready to restring or oh, sorry ready to oil the board and restring let's have a look let's have a look okay oh should I start? right here we are welcome back to the last little bit um just get this done and here we have stringing to do. So I have polished out the frets. It's getting late now, so I'm going to sort of not not to dilly dally. Once accused me of made a nice T-shirt. Um, I've got oh, I've got a couple of little things to do just now before I put the strings on. And um, let's put these back in, and then I will tighten up the jack socket, which has come loose. Um, for that, I have a nifty little stew mac tool I bought from them years ago which is this one here but I will also need the adjustable spanner so not a very good view of it but I'm just going to put this in and lock the thing while I tighten it up You can do it, you can do it. There we go. That's that. Uh, now the next little thing here, we will get a bit of rag. Some of these old rags are gonna go in the bin shortly because I've just about had it. This is a new thing of oil. I'm actually, I've still got a bit left in the old one. There's a deal on this um, finishing, polishing, lemon oil stuff and you could you get it at four pounds a, a bottle if you bought three bottles at a time I think it was and I sort of looked at it and I thought how long has this last bottle lasted me and it's got to be five years or something ridiculous so I thought what's the point of buying uh, five three bottles of this you know I might not be alive by the time I get to finishing using it up so I'm not being pessimistic or anything but it's you know, three times five years you never know I might be retired swinging in my hammock he said unlikely I mean, retirement has any meaning for me I'm afraid you know I'm one of these people who never got it together to retain property even when I bought once in my life in a previous marriage and let it go and uh, yeah so one of the who knows how many people in this country of ours in the UK you don't got no assets babe so it's sort of I suppose it's one of, not one of the reasons, but I've always been of the mindset that, um, not just because of that, but I've always been in the mindset that if I'm going to work, I've got to be doing something that I find interesting or challenging or rewarding or whatever word you want to put on it. But um, So that's always been uh, a sort of focus of mine and very much also, you know, when you factor into that thing, if, if I'm going to be working till... I drop or you know some very old age which is highly likely then um, it might as well be something that I enjoy doing and that is, is rewarding 
So hence my, uh, oh, I just put these two things back on. Hence, you know, doing what I do. Um, and not, not really settling for less, you know. I, I've never been somebody who could just, you know, do a light, do a, a career and buckle down and all those kind of things, just so that one day in the future when I'm old I'll be able to something or other, you know. It just that doesn't kind of mean much to me. It's much, much more about, you know, quality of being, being challenged and. Uh, interested in the in the moment, really. It's vital to me. Okay, so with the restringing, I'm going to do. Uh, I'm make it my business to string the two inside ones first. So the G, which I'll start with, and um, it's always very difficult to get them to stay on the saddle to begin with. So here's how I do it: pull back one fret. So I push it all the way through hold up, hold the string over the first fret typically and I pull back to the second fret and I hold that down and I wind that on and as I wind it I keep my thumb tight so that the held string goes over the loose string and as it comes around the second time I pull up the loose string, tighten up the held string and guide it underneath the sticking up loose string this time. So that sort of sandwiches the loose string in the middle in a sort of locking mechanism. And then I go back and check that it's on at the bridge, which it is. And then I come and snip off this extra bit so we don't end up sticking it in fingers and causing bleeds. So then I go to the D, -d, 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 -d which doing it this way around basically pins down the lock at the adjustable nut part and it means it won't go flying everywhere. Um, it's also helpful if you line up your center your post holes so that you don't have to find them when you come to a string. Okay, so the D goes on up to the first fret, pull back one, hold, wind on, lift it over the loose one. As the loose one comes around the second time, you end up the loose one and push the held one under the loose one. And then let it drop into place, check out the bridge. And then away you go from there. Oh, take off the excess. Okay, so good to have got both of these finished today. I'm pleased with that. Um, I know that Ron's planning to come back and get them on Thursday, which is three days away, but uh, if it suits him, he can now come earlier if he wants to. If it fits in with his holiday plans better. So, same old technique on all of these. Round it comes. Uh, this is too low down, so first thing I've got to do is just whip this up a bit for starters. We'll check the exact action later. Low in, on it goes. And then really, all that happens now is we get into a stretching game and uh, I showed on the last ES339. It's quite a tiring, you know, exhaustive process, but you know, having gone through in detail on this video why it's so important to get it right, um, you've got to put the time in to do it because it's the only way you're going to guarantee um, tuning stability. And actually, as you get older, I find that as I get older, it sort of hit me like a revelation that tuning stability is pretty much mostly what I'm looking for in a guitar. Um, I don't really care who makes it, what it looks like. Tuning stability, playability, and the tone in that order are the things I care about. And I was saying to um, Ron yesterday that it's funny to realize as you get older, that ends up, you end up realizing that that's the exact reverse priority of when you were a, a, a punk teenager you know all you cared about was the name on the thing um, the, you know the, the, the look of the guitar the uh, you know the, the pickups it had came further down how it was to 
uh, the, whether it stayed in tune was kind of right at the bottom and uh, how it played was just, just fractionally above that. And so that we tolerated such terrible things for so long. Um, but, you know, never again. So and I think that's why, you know, that's what I have in, in common with my customers, which is, which is why it's very easy for me to know when somebody isn't my customer. And, um, you know, the ability to, I have the ability to, to very quickly spot that and say to them, look, you know, no hard feelings at all. I'm not the guy for you. You know, I'm not what you're looking for. Um, and, and it, you know, keeps, keeps that situation at bay that, oh God, what have I lost now? Sorry, we have to switch to, uh, why is that dot com down on me? <sighs> honestly, run the video. Is it going to run? I honestly don't know what's going on now. Maybe it will run. Sorry about this. I don't know where that conked out from and to. I thought I'd got all of that on close up. Probably have to zoom out, but it's on the other video of this, the sister guitar of this one. The problem I've got is I can't see the iPhone from here. And if it runs out of batteries or the memory goes funny or something, then I'm, I'm kind of stuck. Or if I just forget to turn the darn thing on, I can ruin the session that way. Now, uh, the guitar that I just did, the e red, the Cherry Red ES339, um, that was pretty much intonated right away. So, um, uh, if, if it was intonated by Rom, then I would expect to find this one similarly well intonated, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain it will be, um, but it would be good if it was. Okay, we're just under there, so... So we've got about 1.2 something there and just on the 1.5 there. So I'm going to do another little bit of stretch here, tune it up one more time or another couple of times, but tune it up and then we're going to the thumb and forefinger stretching game. Um, and then we'll get as much of that slack out of the business as possible. So the next bit of this is to grab the strings, thumb and forefinger, and stretch the living daylights out of them. And the aim, as I said in the last video, is to detune them. And it's we keep doing this until we stop, until they stop detuning, basically. Um, and when it stops detuning, because we've taken care of the half of the tuning equation, the nut with the slots, and we've got a adjustable tusk nut in there we're now taking care of the other half and that's the um, the excess slack still remaining in these strings take care of those two things and you've got your tuning stable so each time each time you detune a little bit less You tend to find, you tend to find that um, your high strings stabilise first, and that there's usually a bit more to bend out of the low um, wound strings. But we're just about there, and I'm conscious that it's getting late in this part of the world. Um, 
and I've not recorded part of this on uh, iPhone video so it's all down to you up there with your single one monolithic view and terrible sound quality um, but we're pretty much done for this so I shall be dashing off home to kind of uh, extract some pictures for the daily work report if you like on Facebook um, and and then a usual late late roll into bed after a bit of guitar playing probably Okay, the last little bit on this stage is to check, whoops, check the intonation. Um, and we'll see whether it's anywhere near. It'd be nice to not have to um, get into a situation where we've got to undo it and uh, take the saddles apart. Uh oh <laughs> oh dear. Sharp. The E is a little bit sharp, so uh, that means it needs to be pushed away doesn't look great from here. And the danger of my worry is that we run out of adjustment room as you no doubt can be <laughs> you can tell that's always my worry on these things. That doesn't look too bad. So I'm doing the rest of these now just by eye based off the, the first uh, setting. These things are such crap tech, honestly. Crap low tech. Ugh. I mean, they don't, they don't even turn properly. They want to ride up and everything, you name it. Anyway, uh, we'll see if that's helped things along a bit. So, the royal lousy hatred, hatefulness of, of uh, blasted, stinking, blasted, stinking, stupid tunematic bridges. I have to br adjust this to intonate. That means taking the bridge right off, slacking all the strings off, which means reintroducing a load of slack back into the strings because you can't avoid it. So I'm going to have to stretch all of that out again, which weakens the strings. So, this is all courtesy of the miracle that is a shitty piece of crap called a tunematic bridge. So I'm going to hike this off. So what we have to do is we have to take off these first three and flip them round. And that means we also then have to first of all have to take off the little pin that doesn't usually want to come off because it's such a naff design. This little retainer pin, um, so I don't know what you can see, or whether you're even still on. Yeah, you seem to be. That's a. I must have just not pressed it before. Okay, where are we? There it is. My favourite knot pastime knot. So we basically hook out this little clip, which doesn't want to come out, so it usually distorts and bends. Clips out, 
then we go for these three <coughs> each one of these we've now got to turn round so we undo the block and the reason we turn it around is because it needs to get further back but it's got the wedge of the block sticking in the way so once we take the block off turn it round we've gained ourselves three millimeters of saddle intonation travel room um, which is what we need but it's just now it doesn't want to fit back in without jamming can you believe it that's such a crap fit um, that actually really doesn't want to go in so now I can just since I know where that is I can now adjust this to where it should be let's see if this will even turn so tight so if, oh, God. right so okay that's not far enough so it's going to go to about there to start with I think I'm going to take this one out as well I mean, you know, look at it. Look how much stress you have to go through. It doesn't even want to come out. Holy cow. It's because it's jammed up too far at that end already. It still doesn't really want to come out. So, this is why I hate the Tunematic Bridge with most of my heart, if not every last bit of it. So, put that one back in there now we can. Does it want to go in? No. No, it doesn't want to fit in. Does it want to go in? Not really. It just doesn't want to do it. Let's try moving it a bit. So, yeah, we're basically giving ourselves back a little bit of extra room, which you should. Oh, look, we're in low power mode. Groovy. Well, it's going to cut out any minute. Thanks for the battery life, iPhone. Okay, so all I've got to try and do, first of all, is get these things close to where I think they should be before I put the clip on. There, there. Sorry about this. If it conks out, I can't do anything. But the trusty Sony will keep going. See, this is so stiff. It, it just doesn't want to go anywhere. Right, there's the line backwards. Uh, I've got a serious worrying problem about this. If this doesn't work, then all the rest isn't going to work either. Oh, God almighty. How much do I hate you tunematic bridge? Right, let's try and get this one roughly into position. No, wrong way, this way. Right, this one should step forward a little bit. And this one should go back a little bit. Oh, they are just such crap. You can't adjust them without them falling out. Look, see? God, I hate them. Look, then, they, then they fall out when you don't want them to fall out. Like that. And they do it because you've got one finger in a bandage and you can't manipulate things properly. Right, you... Ow, you You goshing thing, you. Right, that one doesn't want to sit down at all. That's like completely stiffened up. And this one is going to end up jammed against the wall. And that's all it can do. There is no further adjustment we can do. That's your lot, matey. Then we get the little... <sighs> we get the little... Look at that, doesn't want to go in. We get this little thing, we try and put that back in. Wrap it over the top of there. And then somehow bring it round to here. 
where it actually doesn't want to jam into the hole. Let me sort of push it in and it hopefully retains the other little bits. Okay, so now I've got this as spread out as I could possibly get. I'm going to go and tighten that up, I forgot that bit. Okay, let's zoom out again. I know you're going to conk any second because of the low battery and I can't use the mic and have the battery charging at the same time. Wonderful thing that is, but... Okay, middle one tightened. pull again to get it moving. Now I'm going to do the intonation on, on its back in a minute. Good. Right, that's a bit too long. Let's see if this will do what I ask it to. Hey, now, come on. Oh my God! Get in the slot, you piece of garbage. <laughs> Too long, yes, that's right. You can see it. God, this is. <laughs> I think it's just going to get there on this D. <sighs> just, actually, it should be alright. long as I imagined it would be judging by the other one come on backwards mm, that's okay that's better I hate you little tunematic bridge I really hate you <laughs> done. Huh. Can't play it. I've got no fingers. Right, we are done. Done, 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 done. Right, good. We are done. I'm going to call it
time on this because it's late. Uh, but we've got everything done. All finished. The little key on the thing. We can go home and rest. Dun, 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 dun. There we are. Thank you for watching. See you again soon.